Hello YouTubers, welcome to today's lesson. We're going to be talking about the legendary Freddie Green. If you don't know who Freddie Green is, I guarantee you, you have been affected in some way. Some guitar player that you listen to, especially if you follow my channel. Uh, speaking of which, if you are, if you don't, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe, please like. And at some point in this video, if something tickles your fancy, feel free to leave a comment. It really helps the video. So Freddie Green uh, was a massive influence on many guitar players. Obviously, all the great jazzers like Joe Pass, Wes Montgomery, uh, and even the, the hillbilly swing guys were all hugely influenced by the style of Freddie Green. Freddie Green was so influential that if you look at some charts for big band stuff, it will actually say Freddie Green style. That's an indicative of the strumming that they want. He was a legendary rhythm player. He played with Count Basie's band for over 50 years. I'll give you the really quick story. So he was born in 1911, March 31, and he died 1st of March 1987. He learned banjo off a guy called Sam Walker, who was actually a trumpet player. And I think this guy uh, sort of instilled on him, you know, playing in a way that stays out of the way, probably of trumpet players. Might have been a little bit self-interested, but hey, it definitely yielded some great results. Now, sadly, his parents passed away when he was quite young. He moved to New York, and this tragedy in some ways was probably one of the things that really helped make his career, because being exposed to so much wonderful music meant that by his late teens, he was already performing in combos and bands around New York. Now, sometime along the way, John Hammond, who was a talent scout for Count Basie, actually saw him play, knew there was something good going on, told Count Basie to check him out. Several years later, Count Basie checked out Freddie Green with a small combo and immediately offered him a job. Freddie Green was only 26 at the time. It was in 1937, in fact, when Count Basie discovered him. And he then played with Count Basie for 50 years from there, then on and you know became the institution that we still recognize him as today. Now, what made his guitar playing special? That's something that we're about to get into uh, in three different ways. I'm going to talk about his voicings. I'm going to talk about his rhythm. I'm going to talk about his melodic sense. And I'll show you what I did in that intro video as well. But if you do want the actual full lesson on that, I'm going to put that on my Patreon as a sound slice with the tab scrolling below. And also I'm going to be making a short course on how to build your own style in the Freddie Green way. So rather than just give you copy paste ideas, I'm going to give you a background uh, on how to do that. Even if you don't have theory, it's okay because I'll be using shapes for you to work from. I quickly need to thank my latest Patreons as well. That's Giovanni Melendez, Not Even Found, Paul Warren Wolf, Jay McLaughlin, Denny Daly, and Gary Grant. Thank you guys so much for pledging. It really helps out. Okay, let's get on with things. So first thing, his, his voicings, which basically means the kinds of chords that he used. Now, let's just... <laughs> That sound, very familiar, if you've played swing or jazz or listened to that stuff, you would have heard it before, it's that classic sound. Those particular chord shapes, uh, look, other players were using things that were very similar. If we look at Eddie Lang, we look at Carl Kress and those original guitar guys, Django Reinhardt, uh, you'll see similar voicings happening. Uh, but I guess probably the thing that made Freddie Green really unique was the sparseness in which he did it. We didn't really see so much of full chords like we might with Carl Kress or Eddie Lang. <laughs> We didn't see so much of that. We tend to see more like this. Like, very sparse, okay? Especially when you consider that he was playing in a big band. It's quite interesting. Now, the next thing that you'll probably notice with his voicings or when he played progressions is the, the way he moved around. He moved around quite a lot, even with repetitive progressions, and he kept them very interesting. So I would say that's one of the things that uh, he was the most influential of because he made sparser playing a reality, especially amongst big bands. So instead of going... He would go... Now, furthermore, what he actually did with it to move around, I'm going to address it in number three, but we'll look really quick. He would actually kind of move it around in such a way that would create little melodies. For example, now, there's a little bit of mystery going on there, and I'm going to talk about that in part three. Let's move on to part two, his actual rhythm playing and the way he employed rhythm. He was 
well, I'm going to paraphrase. I never quote because I know I'm probably going to get it wrong. So he was paraphrased as saying something along the lines of, when he when when I play, I want to be part of the other instruments. I want to be part of the drums or I want to be part of the bass. You know, um, imagine almost as if the drums were tuned to whatever the note I'm playing, myself and the drummer making that note together. That's probably not the best description, but I'm going to try and demonstrate. And if you listen to the example in the intro, I really tried to sink in top of the double bass. You will almost not know the double bass is there because the, the guitar should ideally be right on top of that same note. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to demonstrate this with a metronome. And this is kind of really quite challenging. I'm probably going to come a little unstuck here, but that's okay. So I've got it on 120. So let's have a little bit of a listen and try to become one with the metronome more or less. So hopefully you can hear that. When the note becomes part of the click, it's a wonderful feeling. So if you want to develop kick butt rhythm chops like Freddie Green, that is an exercise you're going to want to master. It takes quite a lot of practice. I've spent a lot of time trying to do that. Some days I just can't even do it. It really depends. But that's a huge thing. So his ability to really hang off the other players or really sit on the beat or in the pocket with the drummer, with the bass player, with the rhythm section was obviously huge because Count Basie, he was all about the rhythm. If the rhythm wasn't right, he would he would stop and he would get the band to play it again and again at different paces till it was right. Okay, so when you've been picked by that guy, you were definitely doing something right. So that's the second part. Part three, what I mentioned before, his melodic sense or sense of counter melody. You listen to his recordings and actually check out the Kansas City Six. Okay, if you can find recordings by them, you get a much better sense of his playing because it's, you know, stripped back, you can really hear it. And with a good set of headphones, you'll notice that at times you can only hear one note. And I swear, all, you know, nine out of ten guys will show you that um, these voicings and that's the whole Freddie Green thing. But there's a little bit more to it than that, I, I certainly believe. Check out uh, Jonathan Stout. He does a whole lot of great content on Freddie Green and he's an absolute dedicatee. Is that the word? Of that style. So definitely check him out. He's going to take you down a whole other pathway. Um, but yeah, I'm sure, but most other guys uh, don't really talk about this, but at times he's not really playing chord voicings at all. He's kind of muting a couple chords and playing a line there on the third string that just sits in the right spot on the mix. Even in the big band, it's really quite brilliant. So let's say we get this same. And this is what I was saying before. Imagine I've got that tune in my head or I'm playing that over the bass line and I, and I can hear a melody that goes with that. Okay, probably not the best example. I was hitting harmonics on other strings. I was just trying to follow my mind in terms of a melody over that kind of a progression. I think that's something that he was doing, and I and I really I really do think that that's what he was doing at times when I listened very closely to the recordings. If anyone out there disagrees or has a different theory, I would love to hear it. I know there's people more educated. So there you go. They're the three things I think that are really special. I'm going to really quickly walk you through now what I did in the intro, by the way. So I took a one six two five progression. <laughs> And I played it as a one six two five progression to begin with. We did this G six, and I'm always muting the fifth string with these chords, um, and that's one of the staples as well, which I didn't mention earlier. Um, in a way, everyone else has kind of already covered that, so it's kind of not the thing I went to, but very important nonetheless. I'm playing a G six, and uh, what I'm doing is playing an E seven, uh, an E minor seven, but I'm again dropping the fifth string, so I'm not even playing an E in there. I'm playing an A minor seven. 555 five, five, again blocking the fifth string and then I'm playing a D7 with an A in the bass okay so that gets us this really nice now instead of going back to G I'm doing an inversion of G so this is a G slash B now I'm dropping uh, the to these two fingers back one I'll explain why in a sec so this is kind of substituting doing uh, any kind of E so we're substituting G with this we're doing this weird thing here and then we're going to an A minor and then the D7, same as before. 
Now, the reason I do that is instead of going to the E7 or an E minor, which is, is more or less setting up the A, we're setting up the A with tension here. Okay, I'm moving these two notes down towards where they're going to end up anyway. Okay, so there's a range of reasons, you know, a range of theoretical reasons I could explain that, but the simplest one I'm going to use is just tension and movement, okay? A minor, D7. Then we do the G, and then the inversion of the G, okay? So the chords there would just be G, and I've done G, G slash B, and then the chord goes to a C. I'm playing a C6, so I'm skipping the fifth string. Uh, and then I'm playing a C diminished, C sharp diminished, which again creates that movement to the fifth degree of G. And you'll see that device a lot in, in old jazz and swing, okay, and a lot of music. So once we're here, I, I, I've used, so I've used the C sharp diminished set up returning to G. And then I've done the same thing as before, G, E7, A7, D7. Okay, but this time it looks different because it's further up the neck in a different spot. So we're playing a G7 here. We've got the D in the bass, a B and a G. Uh, and then I play an E7, just a stock E7 with the, that jazz voicing, 12, 12, 13, skipping the fifth string. Uh, and then I play an A7 where I'm blocking the fifth string. And then, uh, so that's 12, 11, 12. And then a D7, just like that. So that's 10, 10, 11. And then I finish on that same G chord I used before. Okay, so that's what I played in the beginning. I use the pick. do that as a little turnaround at the end so there you go guys that was my you know just something i threw together to give you that thing i use it in all kinds of jazz standards and all kinds of things so check out my other videos on jazz standards um and yeah that's that's it if you want a little bit more detail on that lesson i'm going to post the sound slice on the patreon so become a member if you're not there's a heap of good stuff on there otherwise please just like subscribe and uh you know leave some comments and, and whatnot guys thank you so much for watching hope you enjoyed the video i'll see you in the next one